So many of you have just started to hear about bone markers, and depending on where you live, the type of insurance you have, and your physician's preference or familiarity, bone markers may or may not be part of your osteoporosis treatment plan. The more I read about bone markers, the more sense they make to me. This is why I'm very excited to have a distinguished guest, Dr. Stuart Silverman, who has kindly offered to answer some of the many questions I have on bone markers. Could you take a moment, because your your history in osteoporosis and medicine and all of the work you've done in this area is very extensive, um, but I'd like you to share the things that you think are key that, you know, in your medical history. Thank you, Margaret. But first, I want to acknowledge you, because I've always admired the work you have done. So reciprocally, uh, it, your your informational videos, your presentations have really been of great benefit to my patients. So I want to start off by thanking you. You're very welcome. Uh, okay. The In terms of who I am, I sometimes refer to myself as being a cowboy. But what does that mean? I'm in the private practice of rheumatology with an emphasis on bone health, and particularly with a big emphasis also on bone health optimization, something we should cover at another time, Uh, getting people ready for a spine surgery, for example. But at the same time, I'm a clinical professor of medicine at both Cedars-Sinai in Los Angeles and UCLA. So I, I live in both the practice world and the academic world. My interest in osteoporosis have gone back decades. Um, if some of you may remember, I was actually involved with some of the original papers and launch on nasal spray calcitonin hmm. and helped launch it actually in the Middle East on a camel. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, but aside from particular from aside from medic being involved with effective treatments of which you discussed and we all discussed, there are many now. It's great. We have a diverse menu that we can individualize for patients. We also now, I've also been involved with right now with a lot of public health work on persistence and adherence to therapies. And one project that we're very, very excited about that I'm doing at a global level is how to best communicate fracture risk to patients. Mm-hmm. That's called the RICO project. Uh, and, and we are actually doing studies between uh, Hiroshima in Japan and Europe, trying to understand how patients understand FRAX. Is a visual image better than a numerical risk me- measurement? And that's hopefully going to be creating a major change in the way we talk to patients because FRAX may, in the future, it, assuming our study is positive, may then be a number, a fracture risk number of, for over the next 10 years, but not only a number, a visual image. And finally, an image on the consequences of fracture. So we're hoping we can really figure out the way, best way to talk to patients. The final area has actually been what I'm presenting today, which is bone markers. I found them very useful and I'll explain why, but they have their limitations. And I have been involved with bone marker studies through the International Osteoporosis Foundation. And we have been looking at how we can standardize and make them more useful for both patients and physicians. And we'll discuss, have led to actually our understanding there are two major markers, CTX and P1MP, that are reference markers. Bone markers were first looked at from clinical trial, but let's go back a little bit. Let's start at, let's start at first base. Okay, before we do get started, do you have any disclosures or conflicts of interest related to today's topic? Uh, uh, I do not have a particular disclosure related to any bone marker company, although my major disclosure is I've worked with the International Osteoporosis Foundation. And a lot of what I represent have actually been our published data, which we can share with you. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. So now we can get started. We start with the fact that bone is a living organ. As a living organ, it's constantly being remodeled. Perhaps many of you might have a house that you're remodeling, changing the wallpaper, 
all the time and repainting. Well, bone gets broken down, which we call bone resorption, and then gets rebuilt, which we call bone formation. And this breakdown and reformation is important for the repair of microfractures and to allow bone to respond to stress. Remember, muscles talk to bone and other biomechanical forces. And it turns out formation is tightly coupled to removal or resorption. So the bone mass usually is in balance and does not change. Now, the bone diseases like osteoporosis happen when formation and removal are not coupled and you remove more than you make. Several assays are available that measure bone turnover markers. The the term assays, what does that mean for... What is that? Assays or tests or blood tests. Okay, thank you. Measure, look at at how do we measure how do we measure the me- measure this formation and resorption? Well, we can look at pieces of collagen that are involved in formation and pieces of, of the amino acids that are involved in the breakdown. There are two reference bone markers: CTX or CT lipeptide a marker of bone resorption or removal. P1MP and terminal propeptide of type 1 procollagen, which is a marker of bone formation. So for example, if you take, if you're putting together bone, you put together strands of collagen. Well, those strands of collagen, before you put them together in the triple helix, you have to take a scissors and nip off the parts that aren't quite right before you put them all together and wind it up and make bone. Those little pieces that come off, those little tiny pieces, are are what we are our bone formation are what we measure as bone formation markers, um, and they include things such as bone specific alkaline phosphatase, osteocalcin. But I'm going to focus on one that IOF has endorsed for meta, for use in practice, which is N-terminal propeptide of type one procollagen, more commonly known as P1NP. But also, we got We also can look at when bone is being broken down, because you have, again have these collagen fibers all intertwined. And what happens when you? How do you break down? If you're thinking, most of our most of our viewers may know. Think about a knit rug. How would you unravel it? Well, if that chair kind of runs over it too many times, actually, like one or two threads start coming loose. Well, similar idea. If you want, what, as as the collagen unravels, there are pieces here of collagen. In this case, C terminal helopeptide of type one collagen. We're going to be talking about CTX and pyridine cross links, and sometimes sometimes NTX N terminal helopeptide. I like you to remember P one MP formation, CTX resorption. As I've been mentioning, the use of these markers of breakdown of formation has actually been very useful for us in understanding how some of our medicines work. However, I think as Margaret was alluding to, their role in in individual patients, such as the ones that are listening to our call today, are not well established. And part of that is due to biological and laboratory variability, and as well as not understanding how to use them. But I'd like to ask Richard if he could put a slide on. There is a triangle which I think people should think about um, when approaching, and we it goes beyond the talk, but it's a good reference point. Uh, When I'm working with a patient to try to understand what medication they may need, of course, non-pharmacologic management is first. Then we can start talking about medications. But if we're trying to talk about medications, this triangle consists of two points. One are static measures, you know, like still life. One is the quantity of the bone, which is DEXA. The quality of the bone, which is the architecture degradation. That's trabecular bone score. We can talk more at another time. Mm -hmm. And the quantity of the bone could can actually be trabecular bone, which is spine and hip, or cortical bone, which could be forearm radius. But at the top of the pyramid is something we're talking about today. That's a dynamic measure. 
That's my crystal ball. I can use the bone markers to tell the, help tell the patient what their future is going to be like over the next few months. Are they currently losing bone? The static measures like DEXA, they tell us what's happened in the past, but I like to tell them what's going on right now. Is your bone actually losing at this point? Is the medicine that you're taking actually stopping bone loss? Or is the medicine you're taking actually forming new bone? That's a dynamic measure. So again, a triangle. Thank you for mentioning that, that your bone markers are giving you information in real time. So with that, do you check them before the pharmaceutical intervention, if that's the direction you're going to go in, um, or do you even use them before you've made that decision? Because you mentioned that sometimes there's pharmaceutical intervention, sometimes there's not, and you know you get that information from a variety of sources to help you make that decision. So, do you use the bone markers early on in your decision making? Well. Yes, it could be used early on because it could be telling us wh whether that patient at that moment is rapidly losing bone or is they've been on another agent and the bone density didn't go up. Oh my gosh, what happened? I lost bone on that. And then we find that their bone markers suggest that dynamically they're actually losing bone on that agent. They may need another agent or they're not responding to that agent anymore. And we'll talk about that because some of the agents, oh, we actually, they, response for bone markers may wane over time. It isn't always necessary to get a marker at the beginning because we know, we assume that with, for example, with a formation or anabolic agent, that the bone marker of bone formation is going to go up. And it would be surprising if it didn't. And we'll talk more about that because over time, for example, with bone formation agents, the formation response weans over time. And that helps me know is that are they still responding? So that's actually pretty valuable data. I give a good example. For example, our 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 two our two self-injectable anabolics, Timblos and Forteo. Uh, about one third of patients in our experience by 18 months, the P1MP, the formation marker, is beginning to slide down. Another third by 24 months. And another third can keep going beyond the 24 months. And so it helps me learn what's going on. Are you still responding? So we don't necessarily, for example, choose the big when you're taking an anabolic. Oh, well, this is a two-year commitment. I'm going to look and see, are they still responding? And if, of course, they weren't responding, we'd have to go look why. Um, or And so what, this gives me a clue. So I tell patients, we're going to continue on this med anabolic until such time as your response begins to wane. And if you're if it's starting to wind down, maybe now is the time that we could, could start talking at least about transition to sequential therapy, where we're going to follow with another medicine to hold the fort. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, that's good. And just before we go too far, because you mentioned very early on that you know you're doing blood tests. Are there any other ways of testing bone markers? Uh, bone markers can be done. We mentioned earlier, actually, uh, antilopeptide, NTX. It can be measured by urine. The bias of the international, a uh, bias of the group that I work with, IOF, is actually toward uh, blood tests, serum tests, serum CTX and B1MP. There is, we'll, we'll just, we haven't got that far yet, but actually some of the urine tests like NTX have considerable variability. Um, and so... The preference here is if we can't to do a serum test. Okay. But they kept some practitioners use urine NTX. My okay. preference, my bias is to follow the IOF recommendations and use CTX. CTX. And, yeah, and we'll talk. We haven't talked about variability at Margaret. So there's yep, less. And, so just, and again, just these are not common terms amongst lay people, but a serum means a blood test. Right. Okay. I, I visually visualized our triangle. That again, bone bone quantity, which we said was could be DEXA spine hip if available, but for trabecular bone, forearm for cortical bone, quality for trabecular bone score, and then the dynamic measure being the bone turnover markers. And I'm going to put them all together. And why do I put them all together? Because, for example, I may have a patient 
uh, who's got a, a T score that's not quite osteoporosis, or whose track score, ah, it's 2.8, 2.9%. It's not quite meeting the threshold by you know, that we have established here in the United States. The hip, the hip threshold. Yeah. yeah. Which is 3% in the United States. Um, actually, is it the same in Canada? No, we look at the 10 year fracture risk threshold. So for hip and major? No, just for major. Okay. Yeah, we look here at both hip and major in the mm -hmm. US, and we're looking at 20% risk for major, 3% for hip. So I'm saying if somebody with 18, 19%, 20, 10 year risk for major or 2.8, 2.9%, would you not treat? Well, I'm looking to look at the bone markers because that's the whole picture. Their bone markers might say, oh, they're actually in the, my crystal ball is saying, you're going to be losing a lot. I'm going to put you on therapy. You kind of, you're Humpty Dumpty on the wall and your your markers say you might fall off the wall. So we, we use markers as part of the program. And similarly, we use the cortical bone to help us guide us. If somebody had, which is the forearm, if somebody had, uh, particularly has cortical fractures because some people lose more in spine and hip and others lose it in, in cortical bone. So that's helpful because I often thought that they had, if a forearm was done, that that was because there was a lot of arthritic changes in the spine and you weren't using the spine and therefore you wanted a second source. So it was really more for cortical information. Yeah, there are, there are patients that actually have, have a kind of, this is a side talk, but we're, we're having a good chat together, Margaret. Uh, there are patients with more cortical osteoporosis. Some of that is related to certain endocrine conditions like hyperparathyroidism, but other patients, for example, I not a common, I just saw a patient yesterday who had fractures of the rib and kneecap and the spine and hip were pretty good, but the forearm was low. Mm. So that says that the, and the trabecular bone score, the quality was low. So that patient was preferentially breaking cortical bones which as you know, is like wrist, elbow, shoulder, ribs, ankle, kneecap. And that's because that bone was more preferentially affected. That's a, and that, as I said, can also occur with certain endocrine conditions like hyperparathyroidism. So it is, it is useful in itself as well. My next question is when someone has their bone markers tested, should they avoid certain supplements or should they fast or have them yeah. take at a certain time of day? Well, I think the first issue, which I, I didn't get to, was that there is considerable variability. And certainly having a fasting specimen reduces certain of that variability. Bone markers have had limited use in the past because of problems with variability, although we're getting better at using them now. We understand variability we can minimize. The individual fasting not exercising before the blood is drawn, and also by repeating it at the same time of day, circadian rhythms. There are some things we cannot minimize, such as the age, sex, ethnicity of an individual patient, or a recent fracture, which results in increases in bone turnover and increases in bone markers, or abnormal kidney or liver function. Finally, there's variability related to the measurement. That is, the lab that's doing the measurement and the proper use of reference standards and the same technologies and the same techniques. You know, that variability can occur between patients, age six body mass, but more commonly we're talking circadian rhythms or meals. Also some, and, uh, and I want to also point out some of the labs poorly standardized. So some variability is because one lab is different than another lab. So if you're doing sequential bone markers, you want to do the same lab. Mm, makes sense. So, yeah. So it's yes. Like yeah. yeah. Same thing. So you, it is best to do a fasting specimen if possible, but there are certain assays like the P1 and P assay, which are not that sensitive to uh, actually time of day or meals. So there, that's one of the reasons we add that as well. It is le less sensitive in CTX. But yes, ideally, it should be, it should be fasting. What if people um, supplement with so many different supplements and collagen is one of them? And I just wondered if it would have... Well, I think I, 
we, we, I'm not sure that it's been that well studied, but certainly things like biotin interfere with, with, with many laboratory assays and the like. But I don't know, don't know the data. Oh, whether, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, whether coll collagen itself actually does interfere. I don't know that data. Okay. So fasting, it just plays it safe. Okay. That's good that's to know. The, that's the optimal way of doing it. And as I mentioned, um, what, what the preference is, reason why I keep mentioning P1 and P formation and CTX is we were part of, in 2012, of a National Bone Health Alliance project to standardize sample collection procedures and establish a reference range for, for P1 and P and CTX. And we suggested that bone markers should be measured that, are, that automated technology is used and have relatively small spontaneous variability, such as P1MP, CTX, or I could also say urine NTX. Um, but you know, the issue here is uh, uh, ones that are done automated. There's a lot of other ones, if you're adenolines and stuff, but they're not necessarily automated technology. And so they have much greater variability. Um, so again, it would be best if it's fasting and best if it's sent to the same laboratories. And if it's a urine collection, if you're using urine NTX, um, it should fasting second morning void urine. So again, most people uh, are, are going to are going to use a serum test. The other thing, which I have to be honest about, is at least U.S. I don't know Canada, Margaret, but the some of the markers we can only order at certain times. So um, CTX we can generally only order about once a year with many insurance plans. P1 and P can be done more often. So you have to actually know the, the physician and the lab have to know the insurance regulations. Doesn't make any sense to me, but yeah, uh, it's vitamin D here is also only usually allowed once a year. So here in Canada, they are not routinely used at all. Um, where I have seen them used is, you know, I'll have like a young man who was on high steroids and then they'll use CTX, you know, to help decide on his pharmaceutical treatment plan, um, either continuing or discontinuing. Um, but routinely with postmenopausal women, they are not currently used. Yeah. We could, we'll discuss today a whole bunch of re, uh, clinical examples where we should be thinking about them as a possibility, as an aid to the clinician and to the patient. But before we do that, I got to do mention that how do you really measure something as a significant change? Um, there is something we call statistically it's also done for bone density, least significant change, right? Which is a change 2.8 times the precision error. So we mentioned urine NTX. You need a 50% change or decline to predict possibly bone density and fracture risk. When you talk about serum uh, CTX, P1 to P, it's a 30%. So th that's kind of the reason why I lean towards CTX. That's another reason I lean towards CTX and P1MP. Uh, but you have to be able to measure that. Mm -hmm. um, the markers themselves can actually predict the rate of bone loss. They don't di diagnose osteoporosis, as you know. And there have been several studies that bone markers can predict rates of bone loss. Um, there was one cohort study that the highest bone markers over five years had the greatest bone loss. Another controlled trial, those who had the highest quartile of NTX had the greatest bone loss. That in men, we shouldn't forget men, uh, men who were Mr. Oz, higher baseline levels of bone markers were associated with greater hip bone loss over mm -hmm. five years. So there are a lot, there is a lot of data, although there are some studies that don't show it. Um, in uh, and they're also these are talking about rates of bone loss, but what about fracture risk? There are some studies who clearly shown two studies I know, EPIDOS, the epidemiology of osteoporosis study, older women with elevated bone markers, uh, urinary CTX or DPD had twice the rate of hip fracture. Another study, uh, awfully study, uh, OFELY, low BMD increased bone markers and prior fracture independently associated with increased fracture risk. Of course, there's also one study like more where they couldn't find it. So you bring up the, all the studies, which is, I guess, where I once had asked an endocrinologist here in Canada saying, 
why are you not using them for studying individuals? And they were saying, well, and I don't know if it's just because our healthcare doesn't cover it, so it was being polite, but that it's better to, used in studies where they kind of get a an overall trend as opposed to an individual. So how many physicians, but as far as you know, how widely used are bone turnover markers in individual therapeutic decision making? It depends on the decision maker. Actually it depends on the on the experience and knowledge of the specialist. And most of uh, we outlined earlier that triangle together, Margaret. That's actually not what people actually very often physicians actually simply use bone density alone. They don't include bone quality in their decision making, do they? And they don't certainly include a dynamic measure. They make a decision is the T score less than 2.5 treat? And that's generally the way many primary care physicians treat. And I don't blame them, they have very busy lives. And that's to them a marker or simply a hip fracture alone should be treated. For example, you don't need a bone density. Um, but I, what I am saying is that they, it, when you do a total picture on a patient and you're a uh, osteoporosis specialist, I guess I'm a, well, we affectionately call ourselves boneheads. You've heard that term? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so we actually may be getting more complicated patients where we have questions to answer. And so, yes, we we do it, but it is, not widely used, almost never used by primary care doctors, but may, it is commonly used by the endocrinologists and rheumatologists that I work with. So individuals shouldn't be surprised if they're not having bone markers done as part of their you know, determination for right. treatment. Okay. But we could talk a little bit about, you know, about different scenarios together. Okay. Well, let's discuss some uses of bone markers. We could use bone markers to see response to therapy. For example, bone forming agent or anabolic like teriparatide or baloperatide. We'd like to see the bone formation marker, the P1 and P go up. We'd like to use bone markers perhaps to see adherence to therapies. As clinicians, I'm interested, are my patients taking their therapy? Well, the IOF, for example, has had interest in following a marker of bone resorption like CTX, which should fall once the patient starts and agents like a oral bisphosphonate. Thirdly, we'd, we'd like to look at whether bone markers could help us monitor a drug holiday. If you remember, oral bisphosphonates, we will give generally for three to five years and then reevaluate. And it is not uncommon then after three to five years to monitor the patient over time. When we monitor the patient over time, we can see using bone markers whether the patient is escaping from the protection they had from the oral bisphosphonate. We can use a bone marker to monitor the frequency of therapy. And I give, for example, here, ibizolodronic acid. In the clinical trials was given every yearly for three years, up to six years. In clinical practice, some clinicians may choose to give the ibizolodronic acid for the prevention protocol, which is every two years. They can answer the question about whether there is escape by looking at bone markers and then decide whether they should give the zolodronic acid in one year or two years. Finally, an important one, when bone mineral density measurement by itself does not provide a clear answer. There are patients that I see that have a track score that is below the treatment threshold by just a wee bit. Does this mean I shouldn't treat them? Well, if I find out that those patients have increased bone turnover and they're losing bone, like Humpty Dumpty, they've fallen off the wall for me, I'm gonna treat them. So the combined use of bone density measurement and bone markers is likely to improve my assessment as a clinician of the risk of fractures. We shouldn't use bone markers alone to determine, but they are of value when combined with bone density measurement. We mentioned that patients can ask, they can actually ask their doctor, you know, I have a question about, for example, we gave the example earlier in this discussion about Tim Lotz or Forteo. How long should I take it? You know, I really, 
you know, I'm happy to inject myself on a daily basis, but if the effect is beginning to decrease, I pre really prefer not to inject myself every day. And so I, I think that's a, a and, and so a patient could ask that question and a biomarker may help the patient and the provider answer that question. And I've heard of the, these terms before, um, high bone turnover osteoporosis and low bone turnover osteoporosis. And so I'm assuming they would be looking at bone markers that if high bone turnover would mean that you have a lot of C more CTX um, right. levels high up there. Is that something that you use or a term that you're... I, I, I don't use it that often because I'm using it in the context of that triangle, the whole idea of the strength. Okay. I, I, make a more, I try to make a global perspective with the patient. What's going on in your bones, in your architecture? That's only looking at one part of the puzzle. And it is true, by the way, actually, there are some patients who are having surgery who, whose bone is kind of sleepy and bone markers are very low. And I've got to kickstart the engine before they get their surgery because they, they're not going to have good outcomes. So that's low bone turnover. But yes, some of the people on, for example, um, are on a call who might have breast cancer on an aromatase inhibitor. Yeah, they're rapidly losing bone or some of them on steroids. They're rapidly losing bone. So it's me not about high in bone turnover, but what's actually happening dynamically in your bone, if that makes more sense. But sometimes I'm consulting with young people in their 20s and 30s um, who already have low bone density scores, even close to, even in to the osteoporosis range. Some have, some haven't fractured. Have you ever had the opportunity of looking at the bone markers in terms of bone optimization when they the recommendation isn't an anabolic, but rather in, in nutrition, exercise, because they're so young and they still have a lot of the hormones, you know, in their favor. And have you seen anything along those lines? If, if you're asking me, can can aggressive non-pharmacologic management, as you, Margaret, have have actually uh, advocated, check and change bone markers and bone density? The answer I, I think you know is yes, but it's got to be a commitment. You know, we have there are programs in the U.S. I'm not going to mention their name that do vibration therapy once a week and some exercises, but don't really do a comprehensive approach as you well have advocated. This is something that our patients need to really commit to on a regular basis. You know, I, you know, I, I, you, you, Margaret and I have talked about vibration therapy. Once a week is, not gonna, is a great start. It's a good concept, but it's got to be done regularly as part of your routine along with your nutrition and balance. So, you know, if a, if a patient commits to all that, yes, I've seen changes without medication. But you're right. I mean, I'm also the first one, if clients, you know, I have seen them, in, you know, once and then a year later, and I look at their profile and they haven't been doing what they need to do, I'll say, exercise is obviously not going to be your choice because you're not doing it frequently enough or aggressive enough to move the dial. And so pharmaceutical therapy is a really smart way to go if you don't want to fracture. Uh, yes, but if I could add the caveat, Margaret, what you suggest is needed in all cases. It is. So there are going to be the patients who are a little frightened of osteoporosis medication, who's going to go ahead and contract with you or me to do aggressive non-pharmacologic management, exercise, nutrition, et cetera. That's a great start, and we'll look at it and see if it works. And if not, I'm going to twist your arm and hopefully go on therapy. But I want to point out the therapies work so much better when you do aggressive non-pharmacologic events. I want to mention when I get my patients to do the things you recommend, such as vibration and adequate nutrition and, and the like, they get much better results in terms of bone density with that agent, whatever we choose. Would you mind just something that's been very high in the news, you know, um, and I know was a big issue at the last American Society of Bone Mineral Research was the denusumab and transitioning off of denusumab. And would you mind telling me if you use bone markers in helping you in that decision-making of when to transition and those kind of things? That was one of the cases I was hoping to get to, but we've had so much fun talking, Margaret. <laughs> uh, yes, certainly. 
And I think that's a that's an absolute necessary use. Um, I think there are, if you've been on prolia, there is a discontinuation syndrome where you can rapidly lose bone. And particularly if you have a, had a history of fragility, fractured spine, you might fracture your spine and it can occur as early as nine months from the last injection. Um, more commonly, people have been on it for five years. The recommendation has been to follow prolia with an antiresorptive. And most of us will use an IV bisphosphonate such as reclassed IV zoledronic acid. But the reality is, I would say a significant number of patients we first learned at six months by bone markers were escaping. That is to say, they had, you know, because after you stop prolia, your rate of bone loss goes up. It's kind of like there's a memory chip somewhere in the bone. I don't know where it is. And it goes back to the rate of to bone loss and tries to get, get you all the way back to where you were at baseline. So some, what ha, we know is the bone loss accelerates very rapidly after prolia. It actually, it, bone loss happens after all drugs. It just might take longer. Uh, oral bisphosphonates, Fosamoc might be five years, abandonate one to two years, uh, residuate two to three years. That happens with all, but it's very rapid with denosumab. So we tend to give this IV zoledronic acid or reclass. It's not always going to do it. It may work, I think, about 80% of the time, but there's good data that, uh, let's say, another 20% of the time, if you check bone markers first, we checked them at six months, and we gave a second shot there. But now new data is coming out that you can actually use bone markers, in, such as markers of bone loss, like CTX. At three months, you start seeing escape, and the reclass is not holding the port, and you need another reclass shot. So, and then, then I have to admit, there are a few patients that we see that at six months and after two reclass, they're still losing a little bit. And that's a little, and what I've had to actually do clinically, I've had to say, we're, we're going to probably have to go back on Proli again to stop the loss. But, the, you know, the issue is bone markers become vital in a denosumab or Proli discontinuation patient. Otherwise, we really don't know. And, and obviously, we want to, catch that bone loss before it results in a fracture. Yeah. But I think, so So it, it, that's a really important issue. The other issue similar to that is the drug holidays off bisphosphonates, because yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to measure it three and six months, but I might measure year, every year to two years to see has the after five to years on phosphonate, on alendronate, is there starting to be escape? And it, you know, alendronate binds so tightly to bone, you can hold off bone loss for years, but when at, at certain point you do start losing again. And so I'm gonna check, I might check it very infrequently, but when I see that signal, we got to do something. And I know and is that I'm going back on a bisphosphonate or is that another medicine we could that depends on the patient. And so I just wanted to define drug holiday because I know amongst medical professionals we all understand it really well, but that is when somebody and and because people go. It's a holiday. I've been on a drug, you know, um, they don't really see it as a holiday, but we're using it as a term as somebody's on a bisphosphonate because it's usually really reserved to bisphosphonates. Is that not correct? Uh, there's no drug holidays on prolia for uh, denosumab. Yeah. And so somebody would be on a bisphosphonate for three years and you you see that they're, you know, they're, they've done well. And so they will then be put on a holiday and that they're they are temporarily discontinued for however long um, your bone markers tell you that they're holding their own. That's right. Okay. Right. Part of that reflects, a lot of it reflects, uh, it's important to know that me many medicines such as bisphosphonates, the bone density increases go up linearly at a slow rate, but side effects really take off after about three to five years. So by five years, we really... We're asked to reevaluate: Is this what's the risk-benefit analysis? On the yeah. that, yeah, that's opposed to other drugs like we discussed, denosumab, where we give non commonly ten years, up to ten years. But again, I'm not; I don't give things for ten years. I give it until I get some. I, I reach my target goals. Are you currently seeing the limitation with it, or trying to get people off of it within ten years? No, there are several of us in the. Uh, in the osteoporosis world, that, and I have several patients that I've gone greater than 10. I have to explain to them that the clinical trials don't have the data beyond 10, 
But again, the bone density increases just seem to go linear, continue linearly upwards. So we have patients who've been on it longer than 10 years. And as long as we're monitoring and saying it's working and you're gaining bone density and we haven't reached our target. Remember, I, I, I don't put people on therapy for a fixed time. I put them as long as I can see that the medicine is working by bone density and or bone mark. Denisumab, do you have any concern of use over the eight to 10 year period with younger clientele um, having the negative effect that being on a long-term bisphosphonate would have had? No, and not at this point. Okay. I mean, the, the, as we, with denosumab, the linear increase is higher than we saw with the bisphosphonate, but the side effects stay fairly level throughout the 10 years. So no, I, I'm not, I don't have a concern at this point. So you're not seeing the atypical factors that would... Well, we do see we do see atypical fractures. Yes, you can see. That's. I'm not saying we don't see that, okay. uh, but I'm just saying it's not that it's increasing with duration of therapy. So, so you're not you're less concerned about fragility of bone. I no, I'm not concerned about. Yeah, you know, the issue uh, you raised the question. You know, O and J. You, I discuss with patients at all points, and we just say, please talk to Dr. Silverman if you're going to do any kind of invasive dental work, and I'll work with your dentist. So actually, so we actually make sure that it's at an appropriate time in the cycle. So I want at least several months apart between the pro the proli injection or denosumab injection and the invasive dental work. And I tell them it's fine to do cleaning, do, you know, crowns, fillings are all fine. But if you're going to do anything invasive, yeah, you you got to talk with me and I got to talk with your dentist. We got to time it properly. So, so thank you for bringing that up. And um, because so many physicians, everybody has different, you know, viewpoints on that. So do you mind me asking, do you, uh, you know, like to um, have them have the dental work prior, you know, how, how many weeks prior to the next shot? Because we know that the denosumab is, you know, waning in their system. And, you know, we're going to need some healing time. So, and I'm asking you because some of the oral surgeons here are still telling patients to, well, just stop the polia because we don't have to worry about it because that's what they were told 10 years ago by the you know, the, the people marketing it and they haven't stayed up to date, which is so then, you know, it's a sad. Yeah. Situation. Okay. I mean, there are several parts of that answer, Margaret. First, okay. before you start prolia, I ask everybody, are, do you have any proposed dental work, jaw work? It's going to happen. Let's do it before we start. Let's get it done. Okay. Uh, if that, you know, Margaret, I don't want to admit it, but I'm not young anymore. And when you, because I'm not young anymore, my teeth are, I've already had a cracked tooth. And that happens. And not because I do poor dental hygiene, it just happens with aging and expansion of the fillings. You probably know that. And so uh, if it's, if it's, if the tooth is crack is above the gum line, you get a new crown. If it's below the gum line, you got to pull it. Well, if I got to pull the tooth, um, you're going to actually, I'm going to need to make sure that that extraction happens several months away from the proli injection. Probably around, ideally would be, if we can time it, and, let, and assuming there's no infection, maybe three months from the last proli injection, and then you have another three months before the second, the, the repeat. And most of the time that seems in our in my practice to work fairly well, because the peak, you're talking about the peak of the proli antibody, anti-glycan, is actually happening the first month or two. So if we get away from that peak, we probably can pull it off because we do need to do the procedure. I don't want to stop the prolia totally. No. Uh, and that, that's something I think you and I get involved with, with, with people who say that because we need to remind patients, you know, if you're going to take a year holiday off prolia to do some dental work, you're putting yourself at risk of fractures. You can't do that. So, you know, so that it does involve some discussion between the patient and the PCP and the dentist. It's a couple of phone calls for everyone to understand there, there is a greater danger in stopping some of these osteoporosis medications like Brolia than there is, than there is in, you know, just taking, taking the time out to just space it properly. Um, one question is, we know that strontium can give someone a false bone mineral de density reading. It makes bones look denser when they're actually not necessarily any stronger. Um, 
Is there anything that in the bone marker world can influence test results? Not some of that I think are similar. No, not, not that I think are similar. I, I think you can get a lot, uh, certainly other medical conditions influence. You, you've already mentioned steroids, for example, serious in the setting of steroids. Um, there, I, I would want to mention one of the things that happens to me we, well, since I follow bone markers. Um, every year, one or two patients of mine that have a problem, well, it's actually more, have problems where even on their prolia or whatever, their bone markers are, are, are not low. Remember, prolia would reduce the CTX usually below 100. I see a patient with a CTX that coming back on prolia and it's six, 700, something's wrong. Oh. It's not acting right. That usually mandates a full workup. Sometimes it's a hidden fracture. Sometimes it's another disease. And I want to point out, I pick up one or two multiple myelomas that way every year. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's celiac. Sometimes it's another medicine. Sometimes, you know, sometimes there's a period of immobilization. Oh, I forgot to tell you I had, back, I had terrible back pain and I was lying in bed for two months or whatever. But many of the medical conditions will interfere. Certainly kidney disease, certain kind of kidney diseases can influence markers because the markers are, are not as valid in the setting of chronic kidney disease. So, you know, there's a, what it, the bone marker actually, I generally do bone markers at least once a year in prolia patients. If I get a signal that the CTX is sky high, I got to go looking. And I'm saying it has been helpful in a few cases and we've helped identify medical conditions that, that had not been previously diagnosed. So, Dr. Silverman, where does somebody get bone marker testing done? And do you know roughly how much it would cost if they were going to do it independently? Uh, bone marker testing, at least in the U.S., are done through major la- commercial laboratories such as Quest, LabCorp, for example. They're not cheap. Um, CTX currently is about $200. Uh, many physicians can simply order it on a regular lab slip that they sent to send, for example, to Quest. Very good. Thank you. But again, the, I did mention that there has to be some understanding that CTX can only be ordered once a year as, as is vitamin D. So that, yeah, so I will often more, if I'm going to be doing sequentials, such as we were talking about following a therapy, I might be more likely to be ordering P1 and P, which I can order more often. Um, but if somebody wanted to pay out of pocket, then you could order it more than once. That is correct. Yeah. And so, so may I ask, how often do you use trabecular bone scores? Actually, fair, fairly commonly. Uh, so, for example, if somebody has a uh, fracture and they're osteopenic, the I said minus 2.3, 2.4, but they have horrible trabecular bone score, their actual fracture risk is above treatment threshold. Yeah. Or some of the pain, and that's particularly, and I also want to see what damage uh, m- certain medicines do, like aromatase inhibitors, mm-hmm. uh, corticosteroids can tell me the amount of quality damage. Yeah, so it, it, it really, th- and of course, there are medical conditions we did not get, that, because my anorexic patients who with osteopenia are fracturing have horrible TBSs. Yeah. You probably know that. Because they, then fortunately, those years of anorexia and bulimia affected the architecture. And it's not completely reflected in the trabecular bone. It's often reflected in the cortical bone, though. With what you just said, you said it's not often reflected in the trabecular bone, but is... I said it's often not. That's right. Some of the patients, remember I said there's a variety of cortical osteoporosis. Yeah. And some of the anorexia bulimic patients may may have more loss in cortical bone. Oh wow, really? Hmm. So you know, we often see people so the who the TBS might not be okay. Right. In their 30s or 40s who've had uh intermittent menstrual cycles, low estrogens, or hyperparathyroidism, and their trabecular bone isn't that bad, but the cortical bone is terrible and they're fractured. Mm-hmm. That's why I said I, I'm really pushing for a more comprehensive approach to to the patient with osteoporosis and particularly the ones with fragility fracture that we look at all parameters not only quantity but quality and what's the dynamic what's going on and i think that that's the major message i'm trying to impart Hmm, very good 
Well, your patients are very lucky to have you. You're obviously very thorough. Um, so I want to thank you so much for sharing your expertise, taking the time to, you know, share not just your clinical knowledge, but your extensive um, scientific knowledge on all the studies and the work that you do with the Osteoporosis Foundation. And um, yeah, and I also wanted to also thank you for years ago, because um, when I, how I first came across you was looking at quality, um, the quality questionnaire for people with osteoporosis. And, and I believe your wife is an, is an occupational therapist. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And so, I, I mean, I'm only going to assume that she had a little bit of influence. Oh, she definitely did. Uh, she, just like Richard works with you, my wife works with me. And yes, we work together on it's OPAC, Osteoporosis Assessment Questionnaire, which originally was defined as females. Now it's available for males and also in shorter forms. And it was basically one of the, more, the first English uh, quality of life instrument in osteoporosis with the goal, which I think we all now appreciate and you, uh, that everyone understands on this call, osteoporosis significantly impacts quality of life. And that was that to try to prove it. Yeah, and I really appreciate that because I do have you know, clients who are disabled by their osteoporosis and so it's really nice to have an objective measurement like that that you know can be used. So I do want to thank you for that as well. So. Thank you.